Anyway, let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you, Father, for your for, for the relationship we have because of your Son. Uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, that we can uh, that we can connect with each other, and we we thank you, Father, that we have this opportunity this morning to worship you and glorify you and honor you this morning together as a family. Thank you, Father, for bringing us here. Father, we pray that you'd help us as we learn the truth. Help us to be uh, not be afraid to apply these things to our lives. Help us to realize how important it is for us to become the people that your son died to make us. That we have a responsibility, Father, to apply these principles and these, these texts to our lives and become the very best we can. And we thank you for the opportunity. Bless us, Father, as we study this morning. Help us to learn. Help us to grow. And help us to... Uh, to share these things with those around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I told you that 1 Peter chapter 1, well, not just 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter and 2 Peter are a survival manual. What it is. Look at it that way. It's a survival manual to how do I deal with the chaos and the corruption and the garbage that goes on in the world around me. How, what happens when I start suffering? What happens when I start going down? What happens when life throws some curves at me? And you're going to see in this chapter where he's going to talk about them, that they are doing some of the things they're doing in spite of the sufferings they're going through. Every one of us is going to suffer in this room. Every one of us is going to suffer this online. We're going to suffer. There's going to be things that are going to happen in our lives. And this, this, these two letters are basically a survival manual. This is what you need to connect with and remember uh, so that you can put call this to memory. We already looked at a couple of things in the first couple of verses. Uh, we looked at uh, the, that he's talking to God's elect. He's talking to those who have been chosen out of the world, chosen as, to be part of a family before the foundation of the earth. He said he also has said that we have been given the Spirit to work through us and with us, and that we have been cleansed by the sprinkled blood of the, of the, of the risen Savior. You know, those are all powerful things to reflect on, powerful things to, uh, uh, to connect with when, when life gets really tough. How many of you have... Uh, have found yourself in hopeless situations in your life, or seem like hopeless situations. Nobody's going to see you, so you can raise your hand. <laughs> you know, I want you know, the, raise your hand. You've been in a hopeless situations. Most everybody found themselves in a situation where it seemed hopeless to us, where you've suffered and struggled, maybe because of your 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 spirituality, or maybe just because things happen in your life. You know, maybe it just. Somebody got sick, somebody lost a job, somebody had a car wreck, somebody, you know, broke an ankle, broke a leg, whatever it is, you struggle. And then it may be that you've had to deal with, with a, uh, uh, families that, that don't support what you do, don't support where you're headed, where, what you, the decisions you've made. Or maybe it's children that decided I'm going to go up on my own and, uh, and you know they're not faithful, you know they're not doing what's, what needs to be done. That's a struggle. It can be a real struggle. And I know some of you have suffered through that. You know, what better way to have a survival manual? If you get lost in the woods, how many of you got lost in the woods, deep in the woods, could, could survive? How many of you believe you could survive? Uh, you know what to do to survive. Okay? How many of you believe you probably couldn't survive? That you would not know what to do? One, two, three, four. Some honest ones here. You all know, no, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, would you know how to start a fire? Would you know how to get water? Would you know how to... Would you, if you, I mean, I'm talking about you're lost someplace, and there's no prospect that you're going to find your way out. Okay? Would, would you not like to have a survival? You may not have all the tools that it talks about. You may not have all the abilities, but wouldn't you like to have one? At least a little pamphlet in your back pocket? Say, hey, this is what you do if you need to get water. Some easy steps for a beginner. If you need, wouldn't, you like, wouldn't you like to have that? Wouldn't that be good? Yeah, would. So, you know, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have been lost before, you know, but... Uh, you know, in the next part of this text, he's going to talk about, you know, a hope. You know, and, and we live in a, in a society that, uh, that has, basically has no hope. You know, I, I got a question for you. What do people hope in today that is futile and, and fleeting? What do they hope in? What do they put their hope and their trust in today? Money. These, huh? Money. 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 What else? That's a big one. People put their hope in materialistic stuff, money. What can I get with what I have? What else do they put their hope in? Their, their, health. their health. Their job. To get some money. Yeah, their job. Their my health. Daddy, my daddy used to call it accumulating. 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 You know, people people put their hope in their health. Themselves. Themselves. 
I am I am able to do anything I need to do. I don't have any any qualms about I can accomplish anything I need to accomplish, and nobody can tell me any different. That's that that's me. That's what I've been you know, for a long time in my life. You know, and God has a way of telling you, oh yeah, watch this and see what how you how how you handle this. And see see if you really know. You know, when you're when you're in a in a situation where you have no answers, you know, and, and a, a young man, you know, that I put my hope in that. I, mean, I, I had all the answers. Yeah. Nobody could tell me anything different. Nobody could tell me what, what to do. I knew everything. You know, I didn't need you. I didn't you to need you to help me. So I hoped in myself and then and then things started happening and uh, you know, grandkids started dying, you know, wife gets sick, you know, and uh, and those kind of things go, you know what, you know, I got it. God, I got it. I, 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 you're, you're right, I don't know everything. So, you know, I want to, I want us just to look at, at we're going to start in verse 3. I'm going to read a few verses, and we're going to look at this. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Okay? We're going to break this up a little bit. Uh, how can our hope, this kind of hope, how is this hope different than what the world hopes in? What does he say about this hope that's different? And what is God's expectation of this hope that is different than, than, what, than what, like Amy said, the, the, it's the money or, or myself or my health? or How is this different? What is the difference between a living hope and that kind of hope? Incorruptible. It's incorruptible. Yep. What, explain what that means. To it the, means to it, will, it will never go away. Okay. It's eternal. Okay. Uh, it's for, for obedience, okay. and uh, it's everlasting. How many people you think out there have hope in something like money or, or themselves or whatever and believe it is interesting, that it's incorruptible? It believes it is always going to be there. I'm always going to be able to make all the money I want. I'm always going to be capable of doing everything I can, I can possibly do all the time. How many people out there you believe that you come in contact with that they believe that, that they are convinced of that? A lot. A lot of people. They're convinced that everything is going to be good. If it's good today, then it's going to be good tomorrow. And it's going to be good the next day and the next day. And it's going to, it's never going to change. They don't want to think about the things that, that could change it. What is, what's different in this? This hope doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from the stuff that I do. This is a living hope that comes because of the resurrection of Christ. But not only that, it becomes, becomes because of God's mercy. You understand what mercy is? I got some new folks in here, so I'm going to give it to you again. Mercy is when God does not give me what I deserve. That's what mercy is. Grace is when God gives me what I what. Now I got that. What I don't. What I what I don't deserve. That's right. One. Word. Grace is when God gives me what I don't deserve. Mercy is when God doesn't give me what I do deserve. I deserve to be annihilated because of sin. When you're talking about a pure God. A holy God, a glorious God, and me standing there, how do I rate? Not very good. Not so hot. So I don't deserve anything he's going to give me. And yet it says in his great mercy, and I want, I want you to, I want, because of that, I want to take you over to Romans chapter 12 for just a second. I want you to, verse, we're going to read one verse. Romans chapter 12. Listen to this verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, because of this mercy, because of what God has done and what God is capable of doing in my life, because of that, because God has looked at me and said, I love you in spite of yourself. I love you because I am God, and I love you because you're my child. That's mercy. And he said, I'm not going to hold you accountable for all the things that you've done in your life, because if we started writing a list of all the things that we deserve to be punished for, you know, there ain't no paper in this room. It's not a bill of paper. All right? And he said, he said, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body's living sacrifice. You know, that's, 
you know, here he said, in view of God's mercy, what has God done? He said, I've given you and blessed you with a living word. First Peter chapter 1. In view of God's mercy, because God loves me so much, because that love is so deep for him, he has, he has blessed me with something that I don't deserve. Okay? He has given me a living hope. I mean, it's not based on money. It's not based on myself. It's not based on my health. It's not based on what I have, what I don't have. It's not based on my abilities. None of that. It's a living hope that came from God. Okay? And that living hope is because He loves me. And he said, I'm going to give you a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. If Jesus dies on the cross, goes to the tomb, and stays in the tomb, what is He? No different than Robert Wright. It's the same as Robert Wright. I can do this exact... I, I can do that. Robert could do that. We could, we could die on a cross and go in a tomb. What we can't do is we can't pull ourselves out of the tomb. And he did that. And because of that, I have a living hope. I hope in something that is real. It's not phony. It's not fictitious. It's not something that's fleeting like money. Because in our culture right now, money is really suspect right now. There are all kinds of people saying all kinds of stuff what you ought to do. Okay? You ought to do this and you ought to do that. And you shouldn't do that. Oh my gosh, don't ever do that. You, know, you don't know who to believe. All right? So it's fleeting. You know, we know from, from what happened right that health, boom, it could be gone. Bang, just that quick, and it could be gone. Be over. And you look around and say, What happened? How'd that happen? Or, you know, losing babies. You know, I mean, the joy of it's all there, and then all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. And you go, What happened? You know, and, and you look at, at yourself and say how strong you are, and then you turn 70. And then you turn 71. And I'm going, oh my gosh, 80's coming. It's here. Huh? It's here. Yeah, I know it's here. But you know that, and I know now, I look in the mirror and I say, dude, you got old. You got old, man. So that's a call the other day and wanted us, wanted some pictures, wanted us to go see, I'm, I don't want to go see no pictures. She wants an old wedding picture. Man, I was young and healthy. I didn't have any wrinkles, I didn't have anything. I don't, you know, that's the sleep. God gives me a hope. It's not based on all that stuff. It's based on him and his son. That's that's incredible. So when I get down and I get in a, get in a tough spot and I'm struggling with myself and struggling with the world around me, or I'm sitting in a hospital room and not knowing whether that person's going to live or die, or I don't know if I go to work and they say if I'm going to have a job, or if the bank account's still going to be where it's supposed to be, you know what I know? It don't make any difference. George asked me, we were sitting in the hospital one day and and she looked over at me and she said, what are we going to do if something happens to you? I said, I ain't going to worry about it. I ain't going to worry about it. I'm going to worry about today. This morning, you know what I got right now I'm worried about right now? And I got another 20 minutes, 25 minutes in this class. And then I'll worry about the next rest of the life. You know, but I've had to learn that over the years where I can't depend on myself. And this helps me to understand I have something greater than me, a living hope and an inheritance. Yeah, I've talked to you about this a couple of weeks ago. You know, you know, my my family has has a unique situation because we have three separate inst things that, that my boys want, and they all wanted something different. So that's what they're going to get. They're going to get each one's going to get something different. You know, and and so there's not going to be there's not going to be chaos or any of that stuff. It's going it's going to be pretty cut and dry. And and I look at this and I say, I have an inheritance because even that inheritance, you know, what's going to happen to all that inheritance? At some point, it's going to be gone. Even the land, at some point, God's going to destroy it all. It'll be gone too. What do I know about this inheritance? It's not going to go anywhere. It's been reserved for me. I have salvation reserved for me. How does that make you feel? I want you to, when, you know, because it's a survival manual, the next time you get in a really tough spot, I want you to look in the mirror and say, God loves me. God loves me. And God has something prepared for me that I could not give myself. And I can't wait to get it. This is nothing. This is a hiccup. This is a hiccup in the grand scheme of things, a hiccup. Now, some of them are big hiccups. Some of them are hard to deal with. Some of them will change your, you know, a hiccup that will change your life forever. And it will never be the same. That's just a fact. But you know what? 71, come 81, come 91, and at some point, you know what's going to happen? This is going to be over. For me, it's going to be over. I don't know when that's going to be. I have no idea. I want to stick around for a while. i got more stuff to do. But if God says no, you know, I'm good with that because you know what he's got waiting for me? Look at what it says he's got. He said, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. 
He's got this salvation. I have been given a glimpse of it because of what he said in verse 2. He said, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about it. He is a down payment. Ephesians chapter 1 says the Holy Spirit is a down payment. If I've been washed by the blood and I've been added by God to the church, then the Holy Spirit is a down payment guaranteeing my salvation. That's what it said. It's an earnest of my salvation. And so I, in 1 Corinthians, I forget where the text is, said that he is a deposit. So I am, it is on deposit. You know, Paul, y'all are, y'all are fixing, y'all are going through all kinds of upheaval with house and all that stuff. You know, at some point, at some point there's going to be a, some have there gonna have to be some guarantees, right? You know, you know, is a, is the builder gonna gonna want to guarantee that the, that this young couple can actually pay for this? Or that right? Yep. God said, "I guarantee it." Here you go. Here's here's a guarantee that I'm gonna give you what I told you. To Holy Spirit. Wow. So I know that I have uh, something that's kept from me. So right now I have a taste of it. What what if, what have you? How have you tasted, how have you seen the, the salvation from God work in your life, and how have you known that this thing is a real thing that's happening in your life? What, what has happened in your life? What have you seen? What, what is, what's, what's going on that you've seen, wow, this is real? The situations that have been answered that you had no power other than God. Life? Give me one. Give me a situation that, he said, a situation that where, uh, where you have no power and, and there have been answers to that situation. And you know it came from God. Well, it happened. I don't talk about it, long, but it happened there. Okay. And then, uh, for y'all information, he was in Vietnam, and he says it happened there. Heart attack. Heart attack. Two knees, hip, mm-hmm. heart valve. <laughs> well, you're all beat up, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought my life. I thought I was beat up. Man, I remember going to the hospital, and there was about 25 men there. And uh, Wes Aldis was was uh, facing maybe open heart surgery, maybe a uh, uh, catastrophic death, maybe, and uh, and we all got in his room, and there was a, there was twenty of us at least. I don't know if you were there or not, and we all got around his bed and we prayed. That you remember that dance, and we prayed that that uh, that God would protect him and watch over him, and the and the prognosis was bleak. It was bleak. He asked us to. Yeah. Yeah, because he was he was he thought he thought he was going to die. That's what he thought. Yeah, and it was serious enough where they didn't believe they were not sure he was going to get off the table. That's how bad it was. And we prayed for him, and he had that surgery, and he's still alive today. And that's been twenty years ago. He's still alive today. I know what happened. God took care of that. Uh huh. Susan Appel's daughter Chelsea mm-hmm. had cancer. Mm-hmm. And and it went away. Yeah, it went away. It went. You remember that? Yeah, I remember. I mean, you know, if you want to like talk about miracles and stuff today, but God is still in the miracle business. God still answers prayer. He still does. I know it makes us uncomfortable sometimes. I'm not talking about you know speaking in time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way God can work in His children's life, just like we work in our children's life. You know, you work in your child children's life, don't you? Do things that they don't under, understand, they don't expect, they don't know it's coming, and you do things and go, "Wow, my mom is awesome." My mom's awesome, you know, yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, my God's awesome. My God can do things that I can't even begin to dream about that He can do, and He says, "I just want you to talk to me. Just talk to me, and I'll and I'll talk, and I'll answer you." So, so I know that this salvation is here and it's prevalent. It's it's there with me, and I know He wants to save the world. He wants us. He wants us to go into the world and do what He tells us to do. But also, I know that what I have now is only a, a it's only a minute glimmer. Of what's coming, I don't have no idea what's coming. I don't. I only know from the pages of the book. I know what it says. I can't explain it to you because I've never been there. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I know it's going to be better than this. God, it has to be better than this, because this is a mess. This is a mess. Okay, you know, our, the world we live in is a mess. And so, you know, when you look at this and you see, you know, that that. Uh, well, I, I got a question here. What are some of the benefits of this inheritance that are that, are, that, are, that we experience today? What are some of the benefits of that of that salvation of that inheritance that you experience today? Come on, peace of mind. Peace of mind. The hope and peace of hope and peace of mind. You have peace of mind. How old are you, Sid? I'll be eighty-five. Eighty-five, and you got you're like the bionic man. <laughs> got all kinds of all kinds of you can't go through a metal detector without I, had, first. I had a physical the other day and Dr. Espinosa said you're the most healthy eighty four year old man I've 
<laughs> yeah. So I've been blessed with that way. Absolutely. But you, but you know, and I know that you and I are on the other side of the hill. Oh yeah. yeah. We know that. I mean, it's not going to last forever. We're not. We're not. To, you know. We're but gonna, don't worry about. It. No. But that's part of the. That's part of the blessing of having this inheritance. I know what I have now. I know what's coming. I don't worry about it. I told people, don't man, don't cry for me if I go home. Cry for my family. Yes, man, don't cry for me. I'm going home. I'm going home, and I can say that with confidence. Going home. I believe that. And it, and it has to. The only way you can survive this world is you have to believe in something that's not your own making. That's what he tells us. He says, it's not, this is not your hope. This is the hope I'm going to give you based on this other stuff. And then he said, he said that, that uh, well, give me another one. Give me something else that, you, that, is, that, is, uh, uh, that this benefit of this inheritance that you've experienced in our lives today. I got one. I'll, I'll share. Purpose. Huh? Because it's purpose. Having a purpose, having a different purpose, yeah. the purpose gives, that you had before. It gives you a better view on what life is about. It gives you a better view on what life is. Anything else? Strength in chaos. Huh? I said strength during chaos. Strength during chaos. Yeah, you know, when, you, when you bury a child or, or, or at the hospital waiting to figure out what's going to go on, you know, it wasn't, we didn't, we weren't hopeless. No. We weren't without no. hope. No, in fact, it was just the opposite. You know, no matter what happened, we were full of hope. You know, mine is, is I get to experience this with you. I get to experience it with you. And, and that would not have been possible without this inheritance and me coming to this place and you coming to the place. Yeah, I have had so many good opportunities, so many good things that have happened through all the chaos that's happened in our lives. You know, whether it's been death or health or whatever it's been. You know, uh, job losses, that, that kind of stuff. I have gotten to experience it with you guys, you know. And it's been, that is truly a blessing that I think most people in the world don't know. They don't experience. They don't understand what it's like. And what's sad is when people in the church will not allow themselves to go there, will not allow themselves to get close enough to where they can experience it as well. And when something happens and nobody calls them because nobody knows them, and they and they go, oh, man, nobody bothered, nobody cared about it. Well, if you weren't involved with them, but I get to be involved with people, you know, that are my family, you know, like Bobby, Stan, and, and, and you know, Alyssa's my daughter-in-law, but not really, she's my daughter, she's my, she's my, she's a sister, because the relationships we have here, those are going to go away, God. When I get home, and you get home, I am no longer going to be her husband. I won't be her husband. She'll be my sister, and I'll be her brother, and that is a relationship that will continue on forever. And that's a that's a neat that's what I get to experience through this inheritance this bit of this inheritance now. Look around this room and I see the Holy Spirit at work in people's lives. That's amazing to me. Alright? Now look at verse five and six again. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. What does it mean to you? That, that you are shielded or guarded. Okay? He says you are shielded by God's power who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is, is, is ready to be revealed in the last time. Jesus is going to come back with his powerful angels in flaming fire and take vengeance on two groups of people. Those that do not know God. And that means... That word no in the Greek is gnosko, and it means an intimacy. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I know who Jesus is. No. There's got to be an intimacy. I have a relationship with him like, like I have with my wife. I have a relationship with my wife that none of y'all have. I have that kind of relationship with God. That He said, I'm going to come back and take vengeance on those that do not know God and those that have not been, and what's the other one? Obey the gospel. Have not obeyed the gospel. Have a relationship with him and those who have not obeyed the gospel. Say, so I'm going to come back and take vengeance on those. And that, I'm not going to be part of that. Because I know him intimately, and I have obeyed the gospel. Okay? And so, when I when I look at this, and he says, I am shielded. How am I shielded? How do you believe you've been shielded through faith? How, how, how do you think that works? Because there's a lot of stuff that happens in the world. You know, we I get a text from Ruth, and all of a sudden, somebody I know very well is, is fighting for his life. You know, how does that shielding work for you? How does it work? I, I'll give you a human perspective, okay? I am extremely 
protective of her right now. When it first happened, I wouldn't let anybody call her or talk to her. Okay? I made sure that nobody could get through to her because I didn't want it to, to hurt her that she couldn't communicate with you and it'd be a problem for her. So I, And I've been very protective. You know, If there's a bump in the house, I'm jumping up and I'm going to see if she fell. You know, that kind of thing. Very protective. And I love my wife deeply. I love her, you know, but I don't love her near as much as God loves me. And God loves you. So how how protective do you think he's going to be of you? If you're his child, how protective of you of your children? How protective of you of your children? Do you, do you pay attention to things that maybe they don't pay attention to? Do you look at things and say, and I, I see Robert going, yeah, your grandchildren, you do. You know, I mean, we look at our grandchildren and we say, what do I need to do to protect them? What do I need to make sure that they are okay? What do I need to do to make sure that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there to run interference for them? What do I need to do? You know, I mean, I have to keep them away from the bad guys. There are bad guys out there, right? I'm not going to let my, I'm not going to, you're not going to let your 10-year-old go to the movies by himself, are you? Why? The bad guys there. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to send them to. You know, I'm not going to let them walk down the street. You know, you live, you live by Dollar General. You going to let Mason walk to the Dollar General by himself? No. Not yet. Not in our culture. Maybe back in my day you would have, but not in our culture today. Yeah. So you're protective. You shield them. You guard them. Are you going to try to shield them from from? I know people that homeschool because they want to shield their kids from the stuff that's going on out there. That's great. I homeschool one of, one of ours. You know, before he died, I homeschooled him and watched him flourish and blossom in the in the six eight months that I had with him. You know, if I, I watched him blossom. You know, in in what he knew and how, what he learned. You know, not that I'm any great as a teacher, but man, I you know I knew some things he needed to know, and I knew some stuff how to do it. And he and he blossomed. But I wanted to protect. We we took him out of school to protect him from what was happening to him in that school. I'm not going to tell you where or anything like that. It goes on everywhere. But for him and that school, we took him out of school to protect him. What do you think God's doing? How do you th- how much more of a better parent do you think he is than Kevin was and I am as a grandfather? How, how much better do you think he is? How do you think he feels about you? If you're in a position where he knows you're going to be suffering and struggling and you're not ready for it, what do you think he's going to do? You think he's going to just leave you there? He may take you out and you may not like it. You know? I, I know parents that homeschool their kids and the kids didn't like it. Now, I don't want to be homeschooled. I want to school with my friends. But it wasn't what's best for them. You know, or whatever. You know, I'm old enough to go. I, he's going to tell you, I'm old enough I could walk down there by myself. And you're just saying, no, you can't. And you're not going to like it. And one of them, one of these days, is going to run from you and turn around and look at you with blood coming out of his eyes and say, I hate you, I hate you, I'm never going to love you again. I've had that happen to me with one of mine. I won't tell you which one. One of mine did that. I hate you. I remember where he was when he said it. And he was fuming that at me. I didn't care. Because what he needed to do was what he needed to do. And it didn't matter how he felt about it. You know, God's going to protect me. He's going to, it said... He said, and by through faith or shielding. What does the faith have to do with it? That's my part of this relationship, guys. My part of this relationship is my faith in Him. I believe in Him so strong that I'm going to act upon that belief. I'm going to do what He tells me to do because I believe Him. Do you believe Him that strong? Do you believe that everything He tells you is that is that strong? That you believe it that strong? That's what the faith part is. And He said, through faith, He's going to shield me. He's going to shield me... Uh, He's going to shield me by His power. You know, when you, when you, uh, when you, your kids look at you, they, they believe you're 10 foot tall and bulletproof. That's how they look at you, especially little kids. That's how, right? Hannah looks at mom and daddy. Man, they can do no wrong. You know what they find out? Oh, yeah, they can. Yeah, you're not that tough. Not that tough after a while. That's what they find out. You know, I look at God. You know what I see? Man, He's 100 feet tall and bulletproof. Ain't nothing going to hurt Him. And He is my Father. It's my father. These are things, guys, when you get in a tough spot, like he said here, he, he, look at what he says in verse 6. He said, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. What are the trials there for? Do you, do you, 
Do you not believe that God is going to allow sometimes me to go through things that's going to grow me and nurture me and build me to where I need to be? Then go read James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy. Is that not what it says? When you face trials and tribulations of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. When Job, y'all remember Job? When Job was uh, uh, was walking through his life, and he and God had a relationship, and Satan comes to God and says, Satan, what have you been doing? He said, I've been just roaming around, looking at all this stuff. And he said, have you considered my servant Job? Man, there ain't nobody like him. He is amazing. And Satan said, don't really like that because you got your hands all over him. Take your hands off. And we'll see how how, how much he, st he stays close to you. And you know what God does? He lets him. He lets him. You know what happens in the coming days? He loses his sons, his daughters, all of his stuff is gone. It's gone. God lets Satan take over in his life. Huh. Wow. And it doesn't just happen once. Satan comes back again. And he said the only reason he's like that because he hadn't cursed you is because you've got a hedge around him. Take it down. He said, fine, you just can't kill him. That's comforting. He ends up with boils all over his body, scraping them, sitting on a thing, scraping them with, with a piece of rock or a piece of product. You know, how do you think Job felt? You ever had a boil? They're not any fun. I've had one. They're not any fun. He had them all over his body. And he's scraping them, trying to get rid of them. And God did that. God allowed that to happen in his life. And then, and then his wife, the angel and saint that she is, says, why don't you just curse God and die? Oh, wow. What a partner that was. Why don't you just curse God and die? Job Man, maybe I want to have had a partner like that. Job is an example that none of us could ever know. No, but what he is also an example of is that when God decides to send trials in your life, they are because he sent them. Because he allowed them. Whatever it is, he allowed them. That's why it says in James chapter 1, consider pure joy when you faith, because the testing of your faith. Satan's not trying to test your faith. He don't care about your faith. He wants to destroy you. You know it's testing your faith? So that you'll, you'll know, you know what I know now? I know the faith that I have and the faith that my wife has and the faith that my children and my daughter-in-laws have is greater now than it ever was before. I know it is because I've watched it grow. Remember, we were there for five days and we were all there together. All was there together. So I watched it grow. I watched this faith and this trust in God and watched her come to a place where we could transfer her home. I watched that. And you see that through the trials that you go through and you see it and you go, wow, man, you know, this is amazing. I've watched it. Have you ever been in a position where you watch your faith grow? You watch somebody else's faith? Yeah, I watched their faith grow. They lost how many? Two babies. Two babies. Most people can't survive losing one. We'd already lost one grandchild, and now we're going to lose two more babies? Carson and Kylie. And you know what happened after that? They had faith enough in God to do what? Yeah. To try again. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? Where did that come from? Come from that comes from a trust and a belief in God that says, I know God that whatever's going on here, you have a plan, and we're going to try again. If you choose to give us a baby, then we're going to love it, we're going to nurture it, we're going to be the very best parents we can be. And what they'll know always, they have five children. Five. Not three. Five. Two of them are waiting for them in heaven. That's where they are. They're waiting for them in heaven. Kylie and Carson are waiting for them in heaven. You know? That's where how you see faith grow. And, you know, I don't know why God did that. To make them better parents? I don't know. There's a question I want to ask when I get there. Why would you do this? Why? What was the reasoning? Just like sometimes your daughter may come back to you, come back and say, Mom, why did you do this? This really didn't feel very good. Why did you do this? You know, and you have to say, because it was what was best for you. And they're going to say, yeah, that didn't really fit. That didn't, that didn't really help much. But you know what? You know, and how much do we rejoice? In Philippians, he said, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Why? Because God's in control and you aren't. And that's a good thing. 
I have a living hope and an inheritance, and I'm going to suffer struggles and grief and, and all that stuff, and I'm going to rejoice because I know that God is in control. I'm not. And that's why we need to be that. When we go over there this morning, you know what we're going to do? We're going to worship that God together. We're going to sing, and we're going to worship. We're going to take communion, and we're going to worship that God. And we're going to celebrate freedom. Tomorrow is the Independence Day. We celebrate Independence Day every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning we celebrate Independence Day because I am free from sin because of the blood of my, the blood and the death, burial, and resurrection of, my, our, of our Savior. Amazing. We're going to pick it up in verse 7 next week. I want to get to verse 10 because I want you to see something as we get through this of, of what you have and what people long to have that you have and take sometimes take too much for granted. All right? We'll see you next week, guys.